Hi, it's Rob Bryanton, and this is our video blog for December 11th, 2007. And uh, today we're continuing on with a conversation that was started in the last video blog. It's uh, also available online at 10thdimension.com slash blog. This one is called Boredom and Consciousness Part 2. And there is a part three that's coming up on this one as well. This, uh, this idea, I started out thinking I'd be able to fit this all into one blog, but it just kept going and going. So, uh, so this is part two, and it goes like this. Are you bored with your life? One of the ideas I've been promoting with this project is an all-encompassing definition of life as being any process that is interested in what happens next. As regular visitors to this blog will know, I've come to believe that there were certain organizing patterns and forces that can be seen to have influenced the creation of our universe right from its beginning, and that each of us is a participant in the ongoing act of creation that was set in motion back then and which continues to this day. In Boredom and Consciousness Part 1, we talked about the respected physicists like John Wheeler, who have even suggested that the quantum observer could change not just the present or the future, but the past right back to the Big Bang. Still, no matter what perspective you approach this idea from, we have to recognize that the name that is given to these organizing patterns and forces is contentious. And since some people are uncomfortable, are uncomfortable with words like God, I've tended to call these the big picture memes that we can see were a part of the narrowing down processes that caused our particular universe to be the one selected out of all possible universes within the multiverse. Most of us, but not all of us, believe that we have free will, which implies that we have some degree of control over what happens next as we travel down our 4D line of time, twisting and turning in the fifth dimension down at the Planck length. What this means, then, is that very simple truths like attitude affects outcome have profound implications if, in fact, the parallel universes that are created by the branching choices of our actions really do exist, and we've talked about in previous blogs about some of the modern cosmologists who say that this is indeed the case. Are you bored? Depressed? Ill? Then of course you will tend to make different choices than if you were excited, happy, healthy. There's nothing unscientific about simple statements like these. In my book, I talk several times about what happens when we stop being interested in what happens next, and uh, I'm quoting from the book now. Many of us are painfully familiar with the experience of watching a loved one who, due to illness, extreme depression, or simple old age, have had their soul material gradually dissipate or be ground away. This can reach the point where we can see that the person that used to occupy that body is no longer there, even though the body continues to function. Where did they go? Perhaps they really did lose coherence and drift away. Or more likely, most of the meme set that made up that person lost interest in the diseased and tired body they were in and has already freed itself from its confines. Witnessing the death of any living creature shows us one of the great mysteries of the universe. What leaves the body? So that's from the book Imagining the Tenth Dimension. For our planet, every living thing is based on water. To quote from Paul Davies' article on alternate life forms on Earth in the December issue of Scientific American, even the hardiest microorganisms have their limits. Life as we know it depends crucially on the availability of liquid water. A couple of blog entries ago, we looked at the relationship between music and creativity. And not long before that, we looked at a song of mine called Change and Renewal, which proposes that creativity and water may be closely tied to each other than any of us realize. In a sense, this is because the opposite of creativity is death. With no water, there's no life, and therefore no creativity. So as I say in the song, take a drink of water and find a new idea. We could say that the opposite of boredom is novelty. But boredom and novelty are much more subjective terms because they are based upon the way that our conscious minds perceive reality. In other words, one person's boring is another person's novelty. In part one, I talked about synchronicity, the joyous connections our brains can make from seemingly unconnected bits of information, and how that can make you feel like the universe is trying to tell you something. I'd been planning last week to write about Julian Jaynes and the bicameral mind, but then two magazines arrived in my mailbox that same day, and I saw so many connections to what I was thinking about that I felt it was important to explore them. The first of those two magazines is the new special issue of Scientific American Mind. The cover story is dedicated to the study of boredom, and there are quite a few articles within that issue that relate very nicely to what we're talking about here. 
The other magazine was the latest issue of New Scientist magazine, which has as its cover story the smart, strange world of the subconscious. The article in New Scientist makes the point that neurobiologists sometimes prefer to use terms like non-conscious, pre-conscious, or unconscious in these discussions about the subconscious. This is because it's much easier to define what is a conscious activity for our minds than it is to define all of the other processes which are bubbling beneath the surface, some of which are operating at much higher operations per second, and some of which are stretched out into much slower processes. We've already talked in this blog about how consciousness is thought by modern science to be a process that, for most people, operates at between 30 and 90 bings per second. One of the studies discussed in the Scientific American Mind issue concerns persons with long-term substance abuse problems. An ongoing study of 156 addicts at a New York methadone clinic revealed that the only reliable indicator of whether an addict is about to relapse was the reported level of boredom. My song, Addictive Personality, talks about the pitfalls that can happen when people are trapped in repetitive loops that lead them to believe that what happens next will always be the same as what happened before. A surefire recipe for boredom. So uh, let's listen to that song now. This is uh, one of the 26 songs from Imagining the Tenth Dimension Project. Uh, the lyrics to all 26 are at the back of the book and videos are all over the net uh, through YouTube and Rever. Uh, this is called Addictive Personality.
Hi, so just a reminder if you're watching this at 10thdimension.com slash chat, uh, right now you're watching a pre-recorded uh, uh, re uh, tape of, can't call it tape anymore, can you? You're watching a pre-recording of, of uh, me, and this is uh, Rob Bryant and the author of Imagining the Tenth Dimension, A New Way of Thinking About Time and Space. Uh, but there is the chat room and uh, uh, the text that's being added to this video feed at tenthdimension.com slash chat is coming from there. Uh, you can also be watching this at tenthdimension.tv if you don't uh, want to actually be participating in it and you want just a simpler interface that's uh, there and uh, also uh, available if you'd like to be watching what's talking here. We do refer back to the chat logs of what people have been saying into that chat room uh, and the text that's being uh, scrolled underneath uh, is stored and uh, we'll be doing a show uh, tomorrow uh, where we talk about some of the comments that have been happening in that chat room. But right now we're talking about boredom and consciousness and this is uh, continuing part two of a three-part discussion about those ideas of boredom and consciousness. Julian Jaynes, in his epic masterwork, The Origin of Consciousness in the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind, proposed that our current mode of operation with a conscious part of the brain that is narrating our activities from moment to moment and a subconscious or non-conscious, pre-conscious, unconscious part of the brain that is processing data behind the scenes is a fairly recent development. He proposed that only a couple of thousand years ago humans lived in a more integrated form of consciousness where conscious and subconscious processes were not divided. This seems to imply that everyone existed in a semi-dreamlike state, a state which modern society has taught us to be suspicious of. Which is strange, because there are still many activities that we perform much better when we're not thinking about what we're doing. Athletes talk about being in the zone, the place where they become one with their activity, rather than thinking about all the component parts. That's how they achieve success. Be it musicians, or public speakers, or a teenager on their first date, the times that we become self-conscious about what we're doing or saying, we're much more likely to not be at our best. And uh, there's a conversation I had uh, uh, when I was first thinking about doing this blog entry with Jack Semple. Uh, that ended up being its own little discussion and uh, it's available also uh, in various places and uh, one of the things that's also being scrolled through here where we talk with Jack who is a master musician about the ideas of uh, how consciousness can actually interfere with your ability to play really complex musical patterns. And uh, I invite you to uh, to go check out Jack's site, jacksample.com. Uh, he's uh, uh, really got some great uh, CDs there of uh, things that he's played in a variety of styles. He's an R&B artist. He's also done some jazz and some classical and uh, some, uh, some solo acoustic guitar parts as well. So uh, we're going to wrap that up for today. This is Rob Bryanton. Uh, coming up in a few days, we'll be doing uh, part three of this discussion, uh, which has turned into an exceedingly long ex discussion, I, I must acknowledge that, about boredom and consciousness. That's all for now from Rob Bryanton, Imagining the Tenth Dimension.